much for uh, the invitation and having me um, with the Vida North America um, webinar series today. And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, hybrid ceramics and how we can implement this for uh, posterior partial coverage restoration. So we will talk a little bit about the description of the material. We will talk about um, requirements for um, processing, finishing, and bonding, and we'll go through different clinical cases, um, trying to exemplify uh, what we're doing currently on the uh, partial coverage uh, type of, of restorations. Um, this chapter uh, that we, we published a few years ago uh, explains in, in depth what a hybrid uh, ceramic is. And I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the, the, whole, the whole thing uh, for you guys today. Uh, but if in any case, if anyone wants to read some more information, please just shoot me an email or a message on, on Instagram. I'll be happy to share you the uh, PDF file. So uh, as I said, uh, hybrid ceramics, I think they are the ultimate material for the real or true chair side workflow. Why? Because um, we want to be as efficient as possible during the uh, manufacturing process. And hybrid ceramics are materials that can be milled with very good margins in just uh, over five minutes. And then uh, we have the possibility to finish them only by manual polishing, which is my preferred uh, finishing process for these materials. So then my um, overall appointment is reduced significantly and I'm meaning uh, over 45 minutes. So uh, I think that's one of the uh, key aspects to understand about these family of materials. Uh, whenever we're talking about partial coverage, we want to make sure that we understand that we need an expulsive preparation design. And we've solved any possible issues with our verb block. We have included designs of verbs that are expulsive. So whenever we are uh, removing an amalgam and we are modifying the prep slightly for an enamic inlay, for example, we already have that um, ex expulsiveness on the prep design to be able to have these uh, cemented um, very efficiently. So um, I think that understanding your instruments for the partial coverage restoration prep design is extremely important. Also, when we're talking about inlays, onlays, most of the time we have uh, proximal boxes, right? And those could be subgingival as well. So having proper instruments to retract the tissues that are long enough so you can pack the cord and be able to see clearly that margin in the proximal box is extremely important. And also magnification as these type of cavities are small and sometimes the uh, access is difficult for the, for the visibility, we need to use uh, magnifications. And these will make us spread better and reduce any type of over milling. So uh, with that quick introduction of uh, what I kind of try to have ready when I'm thinking about doing some uh, chair side inlays and onlays, Let's now get to the, um, the material. So today uh, we have planned this webinar to talk about hybrid ceramics. The hybrid ceramic group is part of the big family called resin matrix ceramics. What is a hybrid ceramic? It's basically a porous feldspathic porcelain block that is infiltrated with a 14% of composite. So it basically um, reduces the brittleness that our feldspathic ceramics have and also uh, it makes it uh, smoother for the machinability purpose. So we see um, marginal um, adaptation on uh, enamic restorations to be extremely good because the material has that component of composite that improves the machinability aspect. Now, what is the difference between enamic and many other resin blocks out there in the market? That the other ones are resin-based ceramics, meaning that they are uh, pretty much a resin block, and they have certain fillers that could be ceramics, that could be zirconia or so on. But the way that we treat these for adhesion is totally different. This is more of a ceramic with 14% of composite, which we still need to etch. And I will show you some of the research we've done on this aspect. As you see here in this example, it's a multi-chromatic material. So it's great whenever we have, let's say, onlay or overlays, where we need to kind of blend the aesthetic of that partial coverage into the remnant um, tool structure, having the 
monochromatic and multichromatic options within the anemic family is something I consider very advantageous. So um, when someone asks me, uh, what material are we going to use? How do you select the material? Well, I need to, first of all, think about the tooth structure I'm going to be replacing. If I'm replacing a failed class two amalgam on a bicuspid MLD, for example, and this is an intracoronal prep design, most of the uh, structure that I'm replacing is dentin, which is a more elastic material. If I'm replacing a full crown, a posterior crown on a second molar, I'm replacing mostly enamel. So maybe there I would need some more rigidity of that material for a second molar full coverage restoration. So I want us to start thinking about modulus of elasticity uh, for this hour, understanding that the dentin is very elastic and the enamel is very um, stiff. So this is the true description of um, the um, dual network structure within enamic, which has 86% of ceramic and 14% of resin. What are the advantages? As I said, the machinability, because it's less brittle than pure philosophics. It has not a good, I would say, a great dimensional stability. What you mill is what you get. There's no crystallization process with this material. There's no sintering process. So all those thermal processes, uh, if not controlled perfectly, could affect the dimensional stability of your restoration. And for intracoronal uh, prep designs, any slight volumetric change can be the difference between having a perfect fit or not, because it's more difficult to have a perfect adjustment on intracoronal than in extracoronal restorations. So the model of elasticity um, within this material is exactly between human dentin and enamel. It's not so elastic like a pure resin and not so stiff as a pure ceramic cautious cornea. So it gives us that um, nice in-between elasticity that we want. These are some screenshots that I took from uh, Vita's website. And for the inlays, you need to consider always having a minimal thickness at the level of the fissure of 1.0 millimeters. The more distal I'm working, if I'm doing inlays on first molars, second molars, I'm going to avoid having very deep uh, central fissure uh, anatomy so I can assure that I have a minimal thickness. This is something important because the bond strength of um, enamic will make the material be stronger, but the hybrid ceramic material is, let's say, between um, phospathic ceramic in that range. So we need proper thickness uh, to avoid any issues on the posterior area. So once again, when I'm working on first molars, second molars, I try not to make my fissures too deep to maintain that minimal thickness requirement. Whenever we're working on onlays, we not only need to maintain that 1.0 in the central fissure, but also 1.5 on the cuspids, right? This is where we're going to be having more deflection. We're going to be having uh, stress concentration as well. So uh, we need to keep these two um, dimensions in mind whenever we're doing the preparation. If you're using a system like CEREC, I always like to do the prep analysis tools, mark the margin briefly, and go through the um, interclusal space. And if I see any warning, then I will go back and refine my prep. If I see no red areas on the prep, meaning that the interclusal space is ideal, then I will move forward with the design of the restoration. So these are some of the examples that we like to use Vita Dynamic for. I like to use this for any um, class two uh, inlay type of restoration whenever I have a proximal box and I need a perfect marginal adaptation. Here you can see my scan. You can see the margin that we're tracing, but also I want to uh, mentioned that it is extremely important to smooth out the interproximal contact areas of the adjacent teeth. For this, I use a softlex disc or a very fine diamond burr. So uh, I can then, on the design phase, design a nice um, contact area to have a nice contact point when I go through the floss and avoid any type of food impaction. So the design here, it's very, let's say, functionally driven, making sure that it uh, adapts to the uh, remaining tooth structure. And the contact points is 
from my perspective, the most important aspect of the design. So this uh, material comes in um, different sizes. Uh, we usually use the 14, just to assure that most restorations will fit there. And the machining is extremely efficient. It's one of the fastest materials or family of materials to mill. And uh, you can see a lot of detail, as you can see on the magnification photo on the right. We don't have that brittleness as we have in just pure felspathics or, or, or loose reinforced materials. So you can have an extremely nice um, marginal adaptation. But remember that the minimal thickness of the central fissure of one millimeter and 1.5 as we move to the cusps are extremely important to keep in mind. Then what about the laboratory side? I'm a prosthodontist. I enjoy both my time in the clinic and my time in the laboratory as, as, as much. So uh, it is important to understand that always the sprue placement for inlays is a little more difficult than when we're, when we're doing crowns. So try to rotate it slightly to avoid as much as possible uh, the uh, proximal contact area. And sometimes it's not possible. So we gotta be very attentive when we're removing. I like to use low speed diamond burst to remove the sprue. And then the nice thing about uh, V Dynamic is that it has its own um, or specific polishing system that you see here in those two images. It's a two-step low speed polishing system. I always use these at around 8,000 RPM. So with the pink, I will uh, polish the entire surface of the restoration, um, specifically where I remove the um, uh, sprue with the um, diamond bird to avoid any, any roughness. And then we have the second step, which is this um, gray polisher, which will give you that nice glossy surface. We can also uh, add the um, polishing paste specific for hybrid ceramics from Vita, and this will get you a surface that looks like glazed on a furnace when you're working with traditional porcelains. So this is the uh, indicated finishing process, um, doing the two-step uh, diamond impregnating polishers at a low speed, and then using the polishing paste. Uh, also, as a reminder, we have those same kits not only for the technical side, but also for intraoral use. So after doing any occlusal adjustment, I have the same two polishers to use in my contra angle and adapt the final restoration chair side. So um, I would like to now move slightly to the bonding side of uh, hybrid ceramics. And this was one of our uh, mutual um, questions, right, Jim, that we had with uh, the Vita team and Michael Tolley and Dr. Blatz and all our department here at Penn around 2016. And we started studying the effect of the surface treatment and the cleaning methods on um, hybrid ceramics. So we did different groups. Some of them we etch with hydrofluoric acids for 20 seconds. Some other groups we did for 60 seconds. Some of them we over etch for two minutes. Some of them we did uh, 60 seconds and then applications of uh, phosphoric acid to see if that had a significant uh, improvement on the bond strength and until the point that we could see cohesive failure. So whenever we're doing this test, our aim is to get to the level that the failure is not an adhesive failure, but it's more a cohesive failure, meaning that the bond strength is sufficient, that the material or the specimen fractures before we see uh, the cementation. So after doing multiple uh, groups and, and studies in vitro, we found out that using hydrofluoric acid for one minute is the best uh, surface treatment for uh, V-Dynamic. On the left side, you see one of the specimens uh, on a scanning electron microscope uh, image immediately after milling. And it's um, pretty um, smooth, I would say. On the right side, you see the nice rough surface after the application of um, hydrofluoric acid for one minute because we are able to remove some of the um, glassy matrix and have that nice micro-mechanical interlocking surface and also makes this surface more reactive for the silane application that needs to follow the uh, etching process. So um, our recommendation is always to use hydrofluoric acid for one minute 
as you can see here, whenever we're working with inlays, we got to be very specific with the amount of hydrofluoric acid. Uh, we don't want to etch the outside of the restoration because this will make it rough. And if it's roughened, it's easy for that restoration to get um, uh, stained later on after um, cleaning the hydrofluoric acid with um, ultrasonic bath and alcohol uh, for three to five minutes that's our uh, favorite cleaning method we will then apply a silent coupling agent so what we do with the hydrofluoric acid is get this mechanical interlocking that you saw on the image and then with the uh, silane, we get this chemical bonding. Um, so the combination of both is needed to obtain the highest bond strength to this type of material. Also, um, it is very important to understand how to work on the uh, tooth structure. So if you have um, an enamel rim, I will always recommend to etch that enamel with um, phosphoric acid for 20 seconds and then uh, use an application of a universal uh, bonding agent. Universal bonding agents are, are very helpful because if we have any area of the uh, cavity with some core buildup material from a resin material, those universal bonding agents have also um, silane within them and they bond very well to our core buildup surfaces, not only to the dentin and to the enamel part. So this is something important to keep in mind when we apply the dual cure resin cement. Also, we wanna have a good distribution in the intaglio surface and then be able to sit fully the inlay. And as you can see on the right side, what I like is that all the facial aspect of this tooth and the palatal has been maintained and we might win seven years, six years, uh, 10 years and then if anything happens we can always go for a full coverage restoration but our motto is to delay that full coverage restoration as much as possible so that's a simple example of an inlay and now let's move into onlays i think we see more of these restorations nowadays because we have patients come to our practices with uh, extensive restorations as these type of uh, amalgams and what happens here? The amalgam is uh, stiffer than the tooth structure. And you can see the amalgams haven't fractured, but what actually has fracture are the teeth. There was deflection on those cusps. Those cusps were thin. And you can see uh, in the first molar, the, the buccodistal uh, cusp is fractured. And in the second molar, the distolingual cusp is fractured. So here, course we're gonna um, anesthetize and wherever I see that grayish area around the um, amalgam I know that there's leaking so um, I'm going to expect to find secondary decay so uh, anesthetize rubber dam isolation and start removing this using uh, immediate dentin sealing to protect any uh, deep areas it's also very beneficial to reduce any risk of post-op sensitivity so uh, once I've done my preparations, I go ahead and make my scans. And here is where I really find beneficial the use of a same day at his Philippe on the restoration because the tooth is not going to suffer at all as it suffers due, uh, during the provisionalization stage, right? So here I'm designing uh, both um, restorations with a full um, cuspal coverage. So we need to keep in mind that we need 1.5 millimeters in the cusps and 1.0 in the central uh, fissures. When I'm uh, ready to uh, mill this type of partial coverage restorations, I'm going to play a lot with the um, tools under the manufacturing phase of the software where I can move the sprue position as i said always trying to avoid having that sprue as much as possible in the inner proximal uh, region with this i don't have to uh, battle too much when i'm checking the inner proximal contacts um, in the uh, trying and cementation uh, part of the appointment so you can see here at this point, I've already milled the restorations. These are milled from uh, Vita Enamic. 
block size 14, and then I'm trying the inner proximal surface. If I feel that one of the contact points is a little tight, which I always prefer tighter than a weak contact, I just got a little strip of articulating paper and my assistant will help me hold it with the plier until I detect exactly where that adjustment needs to be made. And I just yeah. use a fine diamond burr and then I would use the anemic uh, polishing kit and that will give me a very smooth surface on the inner proximal region. On the image on the right, you can see that that enamel rim, it's uh, very good for adhesive cementation. So we want to etch that for 20 um, seconds. I like to use a thin uh, syringe that I'm sure to maintain the phosphoric acid only on the enamel and not have it present on the um, dentin side. And as you can see here, I've done some um, Immediate dentin sealing. I have some composite covering the deepest part of the um, of the cavity. So, uh, as I said, a universal adhesive system will have the possibility to bond to the three structures present on this example: enamel, dentin, and composite as well. And then, of course, after cementation making sure that we have a strong curing lie that it's calibrated that it's placed close enough to the uh, surface of the uh, restoration so the light can penetrate through um, these um, onlay and really cure the resin cement is extremely important we are very quick to judge materials and many times it's our clinical technique the one that caused the de-cementation so i really pay attention on rubber dam isolation of selecting etching techniques to assure uh, the best bonding to enamel and using as i said a universal adhesive because if i have core built of materials i want to bond also to the core resin used in any area. And here, this is immediately after cementation, I'm going to use an extra fine uh, diamond burr to smooth out the um, buckle uh, finish line and the lingual finish line so there's no excess of cement present. And here you can see uh, a very nice integration between the uh, enamic uh, block and the uh, facial aspect of the natural uh, molars. So um, having the uh, multichromatic material is very important for onlays or overlays wherever you have the buckle um, surface of the tooth involved on your preparation design. If it's just an inlay, you could use the uh, monochromatic one, um, but I think we now we just use the polychromatic. So here, this is the before, this is the after, and then um, after removing the rubber dam, I will check the occlusion, and then I will go with the uh, intraoral polishing kit and make sure I adjust any areas that I have to touch and then the restorations are ready. So these um, two uh, enamic uh, onlays could have been made in maybe 90 minutes because I'm saving any type of um, glazing time, crystallization time, sintering time as compared to other available materials for this indication. What I want to emphasize is on the thickness on the cusps of 1.5, the thickness on the central fissure of 1.0. Here I'm not going deeper with a burr on the central fissure. I want to maintain that. I don't want to compromise at all. So um, I've shown you some examples of where I use um, V dynamic, and many of you be asking yourself, well, no, no, but no, 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 what about no, other no, materials, no, right? No, uh, no, what about no, other no, options? And I'm totally no, open no, that we have different options of no, materials no, and we can be successful with different no, alternatives as well. So for the posterior region, you could also use a zirconia reinforced silicate ceramic whenever you have uh, cuspal coverage, whenever you have a Brookster patient, uh, that would be also indicated. But I just want to emphasize today is that with this workflow with dynamic, I just mill very quickly. I only manually polish and then I'm ready for trying and delivery. So let's see this other example. And these are day-to-day uh, -day cases, right, that we see here in the clinics where patients come with um, sensitivity during uh, mastication. Uh, we do an interconsult with the endo department and there's nothing uh, affecting the the vitality of the tooth. So then we start doubting that it might be a typical crack tooth syndrome um, 
example here. So um, whenever you see um, this type of uh, direct composite material, we need to doubt about that bonding and that um, overall restoration. So I will anesthetize, I will place my rubber dam and I will start with my loops and my burst from the cat can burr block, removing as much as possible that um, composite material. And then with the use of magnification or a black light, I will going to observe if I see any uh, fissure on these type of uh, teeth with that type of symptoms. And you can see on the distal box, there's a hairline fissure there. So um, this might be causing that discomfort for the patient. Now, what I do different from when I was in dental school, I don't keep drilling deeper and deeper whenever I see these type of fissures. Actually, I would like to protect these tooth with a cuspal coverage yes. restoration to uh, try to reduce the risk of that fissure to propagate into a fracture. So as I said, one of the most uh, difficult part here is to remove all the composite material. After that, we will use um, chlorhexidine to clean very well the, the cavity, the deep dentin, as you can see that um, brown, darker brown area in the middle of the tooth. I want to then apply a bonding agent and a composite uh, material directly there to protect this uh, dentin as quick as possible. So that will be the first part of my procedure. Um, and then here I can take the burrs and start just uh, smoothing out any areas. And here I need to create a overlay type of prep design right here. I'm covering the entire uh, occlusal aspect without cutting the actual walls in the buccal and lingual. This makes my uh, scan much easier, my cementation much easier as well, and actually the placement of the clamp much easier. Because if I prep here for a full coverage crown, it is very difficult to maintain the rubber dam in position. And we know that the mandibular molars are difficult to isolate whenever we need to do adhesive cementation. So rubber dam is extremely important. Here you can see um, the strength that I like to use on minor proximal contact points. And most importantly, um, the size of the contact area, right? You want to have a nice rectangle. Remember that um, depending on the material, you might have a subtractive polishing technique like we show you with enamic, which is only polishing, which actually takes out a little bit of the material. And with other materials, we have a additive finishing technique where actually we add a layer of glaze. So we need to keep that in mind. And based on that, I might reduce the contact point strength on the interproximal surfaces. But if it's an subtractive finishing technique like with enamic, I will always like to have a nice green area like this one in that example there. So here I am ready for the try-in and um, I'm uh, adjusting that in proximal contact. For that I use my uh, fine grit diamond burr from our um, Rassler burr block and then we're going to be using uh, diamond impregnated polishers. If you're working with uh, zirconia reinforced silicate ceramic material like Suprinity for example, Vita now has the specific polisher which I consider to be great. I think every material out there should have the specific polisher because many times when we the clinicians are doing the adjustments, we are affecting the actual material. So this is always done at a low speed, no more than 8,000 RPMs following the uh, two-step sequence. And then uh, for these materials, uh, these are etchable materials. They need less time of a bonding. Uh, we need only 20 seconds for any silicate ceramic material. Of this, they have less glass content. Okay. Um, here, I'm applying phosphoric acid to the entire structure as the deep dentin has already been protected. Once everything has been cleaned, then I apply the universal bonding agent. Why? Because I have enamel, maybe I have a little bit of dentin, and then I have composite. So I want my bonding agent to, bo to bond to the three present structures on the abutment tooth. I like to use these Optra sticks to hold the restoration and help me guide the restoration to its um, sitting position. 
and um, I always like to try this myself so I practice the um, angle and orientation that I'm going to be delivering this restoration and then I'm going to um, apply the uh, resin cement on the intaglio surface and then make sure that I sit the restoration and then I use an instrument that can help me maintain the restoration in its proper position while um, my assistant goes with the inner proximal um, areas cleaning them with the floss so we keep the floss there we maintain a firm pressure and then with the use of a micro brush or um, or a bigger brush we remove the excess this gives me a better um, final um, margin the aesthetics is better when I do this technique than compared to uh, doing a tack curing and then removing the cement as a gel. I like to remove it without doing actually a tack curing in these cases on the facial aspect. And then we're going to assure that we cure completely the resin cement following manufacturer's recommendations. And then we're going to here be um, polishing that inner face and you can see also a very nice integration so shade selection is important not to use the body of the molar or the surgical part but try to observe more the occlusal third of the teeth that has less saturation so many times i see onlays or overlays that look quite dark is because maybe the buccal uh, body of the tooth has been considered for shade selection but it's actually the occlusal third that we should be trying to match so with silicate ceramics we do the uh, staining and glazing in the furnace that will take us uh, more time we can always do a combination firing right where we crystallize and apply the stain and glaze at the same time that's what i do for these cases that um, the aesthetics are less demanding that when i'm working on the anterior maxillary teeth where i will usually fixate the stains first and then do a final glazing um, cycle there so um, I would like to address today a very um, now maybe controversial or now probably less controversial topic which is the deep margin elevation we had Dr. Florin Ekman from University of Basel in Switzerland uh, spent last year here with us at the department and he did a uh, exhaustive uh, literature reviews on the uh, concept of deep margin elevation so basically um, in this publication, what he's trying to explain to us is that uh, we are able to control the humidity on that inner proximal box when it's very deep, um, easier for a few seconds than through the entire therapy. So maybe using a rubber dam and using a matrix band and applying bonding agent and lifting that deep proximal box with composite for elevation of the margin will at the end give you a better outcome because you can scan easier your new finish line, you can mill that surface better and assure that you're fully seeing the restoration because if you have a very deep inner proximal box, uh, retracting the uh, soft tissues there and scanning perfectly, cementing perfectly so deep and assuring that all the excess of cement has been removed might be a challenge. So this is just some food for thought Years ago, I was still very hesitant with the deep margin elevation. Now it's something that we have more information that this can work. So this is a nice example. This case was made by Dr. Ayub, who was a fellow here last year. And uh, here you can see this is too deep for going directly with the uh, indirect restoration. So after rubber dam and a matrix band, you can lift that with a direct composite. And then you can go ahead and prep for your onlay and some part of that margin will be sitting on natural tooth structure and some part of that margin will be on um, direct composite, something that has been thought to be contraindicated for many, many years. And I understand that side, but I think that's why we're investing here this extra hour to kind of be aware of what's going on from the uh, evidence in dentistry and now we understand that this is a viable alternative to a crown lengthening surgery because when we go and open a flap and reduce the bone and then suture the tissue and then wait for that tissue to uh, heal and stabilize 
then uh, we might be having another issue, which, which is blood triangles and food impaction as well. And that could be even more uncomfortable for the patient. So this is something that it is technique sensitive. It's nothing I'm going to be doing in five minutes, right? Uh, I need time, I need a, a long appointment, but it does work. Adhesive dentistry, it's something we need to consider for these scenarios as well. And as Jim was saying, right, in this era of uh, monolithic zirconia, and um, we know it's the material m used more uh, worldwide now, um, we do have the possibility to consider monolithic zirconia for posterior restorations. I think it makes a lot of sense because now with the new um, developments in the zirconia world, we have um, monolithic options that are more aesthetic, that have uh, sufficient flexural strength and can be speed centered, like the group in the middle, which is the 4% ITRA stabilized zirconia. And this is what we can speed center. We cannot spinter speed center the um, cubic zirconia, the 5% of yttria. So I would focus on this group for whatever is intended to be used on a same day monolithic uh, zirconia overlay type of restoration. So uh, Vida has their uh, blog for this um, indication that can be used in combination with the uh, Cerex Speedfire, which is a great option for speed sintering. So whenever I see an excessively uh, worn surface. I see a patient, obviously, uh, bruxer, clencher, with parafunctions, with strong mass or muscles. So here we can also now think about using zirconia because we're replacing in this type of restorations mostly the outside of the tooth, the rigid part of the tooth, which is um, enamel. So whenever I need to do a core buildup, we will always use resin because that's more um, similar to the elasticity of dentin, but for the external side, you could also use a more rigid material. What I would never indicate zirconia for would be an inlay because that would be totally against the, um, the, the natural elasticity of the structures that are present in those areas. So this is a better image that shows you how I'm trying to check for the occlusal third shape. Here, the body of those teeth is an A3, but I'm going to mill actually an A2 because there's less chroma on that occlusal surface. Whenever I'm designing uh, zirconia overlays, I want to try to um, design defensively, meaning that the strength of the occlusal contact points are going to be slightly less than the adjacent teeth. Because if I'm planning also to glaze this, I don't want to be having a high contact on the zirconia and then needing to uh, work too much on that. Um, surface. So I like to do slight less the design in an infra occlusion and then make a nice finishing process. For monolithic zirconia, uh, we use the uh, Dialyte Zirconia Polishing Kit. There are many good options in the market from different manufacturers, but my suggestion is to make sure that you have a specific set of zirconia polishers. These ones uh, usually come also in a two-step and with these shapes you can polish very nicely the occlusal surfaces and this adapts to the natural morphology after any type of occlusal adjustment. Now, if you want to also be conservative and use zirconia, yeah. you got to remind, well, keep in mind the APC concept described by Dr. Blatz, right? Zirconia is not etchable material. So instead of hydrofluoric acid, we need to do an air abrasion with aluminum oxide particles, 50 micron size at a low pressure of two bars. Once that surface has been treated, then we need to use a specific primer that contains MDP. That's the ability to bond to oxides, not the regular silane coupling agent. In this example, we're using the uh, Clearfield Ceramic Primer Plus and then a composite resin cement system. Now, whenever you feel confused of when to use a cleaner or when not, if you don't have a sandblaster and your lab is doing the sandblasting for you after doing the trying, you do need to use a cleaner. But my recommendation for clinicians would be to nowadays have a sandblaster unit. So after trying, you're gonna clean the restoration with ultrasonic bath and alcohol, and then you do the air abrasion. That will make sure that you start your process at a rough surface that it's cleaned, and then you're gonna apply 
your MDP primer, and then you're going to have a strong bonding to that zirconia. Also, keep in mind that we want to be very detailed on the bonding, not only to the zirconia surface, but also to the um, abutment tooth. So that enamel rim, as I showed before, we're going to etch it with phosphoric acid, then we're going to apply our universal bonding agent so it can bond to the resin in the core, the dentin, and the enamel. We want a bonding agent that has the ability to bond to the three uh, present structures on our preparation. And this is the beauty of partial coverage, right? That we're maintaining more healthy tooth structure. We're working super gingival so uh, the patient can actually clean that interface with the toothbrush. And for us in the clinic, it's very easy to place the uh, rubber dam and have it maintained down there. Um, so we have a nice working environment, which is critical for the success of this type of posterior partial coverage restorations. And in this world of partial coverage, what about single posterior zirconia crowns? I think they also have an indication, right? Uh, why? Because many times I have an initial situation where the tooth has already been prepped. Maybe the patient came with a previous failing restoration or like this case that the patient came with a terrible provisional um, done in, in the same city where, where we uh, practice and the patient was um, concerned that the provisional was falling and falling out. So that's why it's important also to pay attention to the quality of our provisional. So here, what we basically did was, you know, remove this excess of cement that was there and then just try to smooth out the preparation. But actually in the second molar region, sometimes we are very tight with space. Many times these second molars are very short um, in size so uh, apically. And we nowadays have zirconias that are very strong that could be milled at no more than one millimeter even 0.8 um, of a millimeter. So also that's a valid indication for monolithic zirconia in the posterior area. And that's what we use for this um, specific case. As you can see, the job comes from the lab and uh, you can see a very nice and broad interproximal contact area that will avoid having foot impaction on this type of um, second molar crowns. On the palatal surface, I always like to maintain slightly supragingival to assure that I have a perfect uh, marginal adaptation, that the patient can um, brush that interface, and it's not in the aesthetic zone as this is a second molar. So this is a before, this is the after. Uh, new versions of monolithic zirconia have a good indication to be treating these type of cases where maybe we have uh, Broxer patients or we have a lack of uh, restorative space. So um, I wanted to kind of give an overview today where I see a straightforward uh, workflow with hybrid ceramics and it's uh, so simple just to um, mill very quick and then manual polish and that's it. Uh, also for overlays in the molar region, uh, zirconia reinforced silicate ceramics are a good alternative and monolithic zirconia can also be used. Now, uh, what type of adhesive cementation we would use for uh, posterior zirconia crowns? Nowadays, we also have universal cements that within the cement, we have the components from the silane or the components from the MDP. So we just would need to air abrade and then apply the cement because the primer or the silane is already inside. So instead of the APC, we will just call this, when you use an universal cement, AC concept. Always air abrasion on zirconia because that's how we treat that surface. And then the universal composite resin cement. If you still want to use uh, everything separated, as I do in many cases, I like to use the air abrasion, then the direct application of the primer and the composite um, resin cement for this type of uh, short uh, posterior zirconia crowns. And this is one of our most cited article um, published in the Journal of Dental Research. And here, uh, after doing a long review, we were able to see the um, evidence there 
that shows that zirconia is so strong that really doesn't need uh, resin cementation. So we can use whenever you have conventional uh, crown and bridge work type of preparations with retention and resistance form, you can use a glass ionomer, you'd even use a phosphate cement because um, the zirconia doesn't need that reinforcement provided by the adhesive cementation techniques like other materials need, right? But if you want to start using also zirconia on a um, less invasive prep design, as we were talking today, in kind of overlay type of restorations, you got to watch out. You got to make sure you understand how to bond these properly because it's not an etchable material. You got to follow the APC concept, air abrasion, primer, and a composite resin cement. And if you have a universal resin cement, then you will always still air abrade and then apply your universal resin cement that has the uh, MDP component within the cement. And with that, you're going to be able to have a strong bond to um, these type of materials. So remember, um, always look at each case individually, not only observe what's going on in the affected tooth, but also the adjacent teeth, uh, give us a lot of signs that are important to consider. But whenever I see a aggressive cupping, aggressive uh, wear on the occlusal surfaces, I might be more inclined to use a material with a higher flexural strength, right? Um, and also if I see no evidence of wear, not every evidence of, of grinding, etc., then I can use um, a hybrid ceramic material without any problem. And uh, whether it's in the bicuspid area or in the molar area, but always make sure that I have that minimal thickness of one millimeter. I try to be safe when I'm practicing dentistry. And that's why we believe that we gotta always have two or three options, but definitely our hybrid ceramics are a great option for these type of partial coverage restorations. The best indication from my perspective for enamic inlays, they uh, mill so quick and so smooth, and this makes the whole procedure um, to be finished um, very efficiently as well. So conclusions, practice evidence-based CADCAM dentistry. That's why we we not only go for only one material, right? We, we try to kind of observe what's going on and see all the different options that we have that have been validated. And partial coverage restoration, it's about details, right? It's much easier to prep a full crown. It's much easier to cement a full crown than doing a nice inlay or a nice overlay. But the value that we are giving our patients is that we are maintaining more healthy tooth structure that can never be, um, replaced, right, or brought back again. And also remember that whenever we do partial coverage on the future, we can always go for a more invasive um, full coverage restoration design. But if we start mutilating right away, what's going to happen in 20 years to that tooth? What's going to happen in uh, even more time, right? So um, the use of partial coverage makes us buy time um, to um, do that full coverage restoration later on. Remember to work on your skills. Let's, uh, if you're clinicians, take courses from dental technicians, um, try to enhance your polishing techniques, your, your concepts of morphology, your stain glaze as well. And that will always make our restorations look also much better. For the VA dynamic, uh, we do have the option of staining and glazing with the VM, um, with the LC, right, with the light curing uh, staining system, which is new and it's much better than the first generation. I personally prefer more to just polish um, the restorations when I'm working on the um, posterior region, right? But that's also a possibility and that possibility would need to be considered if you're looking to use enamic on the aesthetic zone, right? That was not my topic today, but I just wanted to close with that uh, clarification. You can do stain and glazing on enamic, but it's the um, light curing system that should be used. So um, Tim, I think we have uh, seven minutes for any any questions. So uh, I would like to, to give some time uh, for us to try to um, address these questions if, if there are 
some. And thanks again for, for your time. And I hope this information from today has been useful on understanding the different options and the, the space that we see for uh, V-Dynamic on this type of partial coverage restorations. All right. <clears throat> Great, Julian. That was excellent. Uh, appreciate all the time, all the effort you put into uh, doing these webinars. Um, we do have a couple questions, but before we get there, uh, so that anyone that has a question about PE letters and so forth, um, we using your registration information, we will send that to you. Um, the workshop has been recorded. So on our Vita North America YouTube channel, you can go visit that and re, uh, listen to some of the comments that uh, Julian's presented today, along with other um, webinars that Julian has done in the, in the past. Um, and we have things scheduled with Julian again in the future as well. Uh, so please visit us on that website. Uh, if you need to get a hold of one of our reps, you certainly can, uh, can do that along with our help desk. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, many uh, webinars going on the rest of this year. So hopefully you'll be able to get time and visit us again for some other additional webinars that we have. Uh, we have all sorts from dentures, removables to fix, to layering, to inlays, onlays, veneers, and so forth. And then, of course, Dr. Uh, Conejo has graciously provided you with his uh, contact information. So if you do contact him, just note that he's uh, busy, busy uh, doing programs um, as a professor there at UPenn and may not uh, get back to you right away. Uh, so I have patience with him. Uh, so, Julian, uh, one of the questions that we have is, um, can the hybrid material be used for bridges? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I would say no. Why? Because it's a material that has a lower um, flexural strength than the materials that are needed for um, fixed dental prosthesis, right? Uh, actually, the let's say weakest material that can be used for a fixed dental prosthesis would be a lithium disilicate and it's in a way compromised because we need to use much bigger connectors so for the fixed dental prosthesis our material here of selection is always zirconia because you can design it with better morphology with uh, smaller um, connectors so um, um, any hybrid ceramic or any resin block restoration should be used for um, single unit. All right. And then you already answered it. Uh, one of the questions was, um, can the material be uh, characterized? And at the end there, you you added that in with the accent uh, LC light here. Yeah, um, but I think here with, with that that point, Jim, also I wanted to, to, to hear uh, your your uh, thoughts because you're very experienced on the on the lab side as well and um, we have a, a second generation of uh, light curing stains from Vita now right and and I've tested this one and it, w it was much better than the first generation um, the first generation um, it was a little difficult for me to work it and I always felt like a little sticky surface well the second one gave me a, a great um, a, a great great feeling. Uh, I'm more, as I said, prone to, to polishing, but I, I think that nowadays this has gotten uh, much, much better. You want to add something, Jim? Uh, I, I'm forgetting the, the, the exact name of the, of the newer um, product. Yeah, it, it's Accent LC. Uh, LC, white. perfect. Sure, yeah. yeah, LC stands for light curing. So it's the same accent for uh, characterization, but the light curing one would be the one that we need to use. We cannot use um, firing on any hybrid ceramic or resin blocks, right? They will burn. Correct. Yeah, it'll turn. Uh, the matrix will will stay there. So something like enamic, uh, if you do put it in the oven accidentally, it'll come out intact. The entire uh, shape will still be intact. It'll be together because of the matrix, but all the polymer will burn out. Yeah. And so it'll just look like a big white opacious uh, crown. It would be a porous restoration. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th thank you uh, for commenting on that. Uh, 
does uh, the hybrid material does it work with implant cases? Uh, yeah, you can. There's a specific block called Vita Enamic IS for implant solution, right? Uh, and that could be used for uh, screw retain implant crowns within the uh, CEREC software. So um, remember that if you're going to be bonding these screw retain crowns on implants, you got to also bond very well to the titanium surface, right? So we already review how to bond to the enamic side, right? Etching with hydrofluoric acid for 60 seconds and then applying a silane coupling agent. If you would be needing to bond to the tie base, the titanium surface can be air abraded with aluminum oxide or sandblasted. And then you would need to apply uh, um, a specific primer to bond to oxides that has MDP, right? So um, that is the uh, important aspect uh, to use there. I think now you guys are seeing uh, the schedule of the webinars, but if you see the upper top left corner, that's the uh, Vita Enamic Implant Solution block that I'm uh, mentioning and referring uh, to. So we've done uh, some webinars on, on the topic. If you want to go to the um, Vita North America YouTube channel, you can find some of my webinars on that topic. Today we were focusing more on the um, inlay, onlay, overlay type of restoration, but it is uh, an option. And then uh, for zirconia crowns, uh, do you change your prep margin, the style? Do you still use a chamfer, or is there a different uh, uh, marginal um, uh, preps you do depending on the material you choose? Yeah. So um, for you know philosophic ceramics, um, hybrids, or or silicate ceramics, I, I would do a, a chamfer finish line, right? Uh, because we want to give thickness to the material in that cervical area where there are tensions and compression forces. Um, what zirconia offers, it's a superior uh, flexural strength, so it can also be uh, produced as a feather uh, edge type of preparation design. So let's say if I have an area on the lingual side or deep molar region that I cannot mark my clean chamfer can i do kind of a feather edge finish line with zirconia yes and that would be the only material uh we feel uh confident doing that type of finish line so that's why you know we are not on the motto of one material for uh, everything no we think that we need two or three types of options and with that we can solve any clinical case as best as possible all right well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Caneo. I know you got a busy schedule ahead of you. Uh, any last parting uh, words you want to leave to the audience? Yeah, no, I would say uh, let's keep going partial coverage, right? I think that uh, that's the dentistry of, of today and the future. It is uh, a technique sensitive uh, type of, of dentistry, but uh, it makes it also more exciting. And with all the technology that we have today, not only from the material side, uh, but also from the scanning and, and and uh, production side, I think that more and more of the teeth that we treat could be um, solved the issues with partial coverage, coverage restorations. All right. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to do the, deliver your message, uh, Dr. Caneo. Um, all the attendees, uh, thank you very much for visiting us on the uh, Vita Academy webinar today. Uh, look forward to uh, further webinars with you, Dr. Conejo. Uh, we can certainly uh, use the education for sure in the in this uh, dental market. So, uh, so thank you again, and I want to say everyone, thank you for joining us. And this will conclude today's webinar. So, thank you very much for joining us, and have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>